Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the All Saints podcast. I'm here with my good friend and one of your pastors, Pastor Jeff Shaw. Hello, everyone. Good to be back. And today we are going to be picking up uh, a topic that I, well, let's be honest, I kind of landed myself in it and dropped a few uh, (laughs) hints that we might need to be talking about this at some point in the future. Uh, Yesterday was Sunday, the 10th of September, and I preached from Acts chapter 2, the first 13 verses, which, of course, uh, recount the gift of the Spirit at Pentecost and the associated signs, the uh, gift of tongues and the fire and the wind and so on. And that generates a bunch of questions, which I hinted at uh, in the introduction of the sermon. You remember, if you were there, I talked about Agnes Osman, 1st of January, 1901, Hmm. and her experience of speaking in other languages, which became really a uh, prototype, uh, uh, an aspiration for many, many other believers, and over the 120 years or so since then, the Pentecostal movement and the Charismatic movement and other movements that in one way or another have been influenced by... Now, we, uh, yeah, was uh, she the beginner of the Azusa Street uh, she, Revival? Sorry, she was... Sorry. The Azusa Street Revival started a few years later, oh, just okay. a few years later, okay. uh, by 1903, 1904, I think, okay. um, with one of Charles Parham's students. Charles Parham, as you remember, was the... Um, he was the founder of the Bible school in Topeka, Kansas, okay. where all this started. And so there's a bunch of questions. So uh, we, we, the world is now filled with 644 million Christians or people who profess faith in Christ who in one way or another are influenced by Pentecostalism. So either in old school, Bible thumping, classic Pentecostalism, Mm -hmm. or in uh, some of the less orthodox forms of Pentecostalism, oneness Pentecostalism, Mm -hmm. uh, or in other denominations that have been influenced by the charismatic movement from the 1960s, which in a sense brought Pentecostal concerns, and particularly the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy, into other denominations. So Catholic, Anglican, Uh, even some uh, Presbyterian and certainly Baptist and independent churches. There are charismatic Christians all over there. And and Mm -hmm. Pastor Shaw and I were talking earlier today, and we discovered that there's even more to talk about than we realized. And Mm -hmm. we'd just love to wander through. (laughs) Well, I would just love to wander through. And I've managed to strong arm my friend here to come and join (laughs) me as we wander through the issues. And we want to just try and work methodically through some of the questions that arise from... uh, Pentecostal Christianity in the modern world and from their claims about Acts chapter 2 and 1 Corinthians 12, 14 and so on. Mm-hmm. So I don't know, where do you want to start? Um, do, How do, you have, about, do you want to lay something down just to put a, a, a stake in the ground? Yeah. Or do you want me to throw a few ideas out? Well, so we talked a little bit earlier. We were trying, I was just trying to find out. It's, it's always good heading into a podcast to find out if we're on the same page ahead of time. <laughs> do a little cheating, thing? right? So, I mean, a couple of uh, places we could start is, um, and well, they, they come together, is cessation and revelation. Right, yeah. I okay. think revelation is really a good place to start because I think Acts 2 is God communicating the gospel right. to Jews from every nation under heaven who yeah. are assembled in Jerusalem. So, this is an issue of revelation, and I think tongues probably needs to be understood within revelation first right and so i think this is this could become a really foundational yes 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 conversation but so 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 let's just um you mentioned acts two let's just mm-hmm. get a few points that really should be undisputable um what act two narrates and i did mention this in passing yesterday mm-hmm. is uh, a miraculous event whereby a, a multitude of believers were speaking in real human languages that they hadn't previously learned. Um, And that's clarified in the text. How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and so on and so forth. And what this is doing in the context of the book of Acts and in the context of the Bible as a whole, um, first it's gathering together a bunch of old covenant uh, imagery and symbolism uh, connected with where it is in the calendar. It's the peculiar blessings of uh, the people of Israel now opened to the world. Mm-hmm. Um, it is, in particular, from Genesis 11, it is the overcoming of the curse of Babel, where at Babel what happened was that languages were confused so that people couldn't understand each other right. in judgment on humanity for their rebellion. Here, 
the languages are no longer a barrier. The people come together and are able to understand one another again. And ever since the earliest days of the church, this has been understood as a reversal right. of the curse of Babel. Yeah, and I think that's absolutely foundational. In fact, just to be pithy about it, right? at, at Babel, he confused and scattered, and here he gathers to communicate. Right. Right. Yes. So it's really yes. you know the yes. opposite of that. And, and what's intriguing, just to keep the Pentecostal movement in our sights as we're looking at this biblical material, that seems to be the gift that Agnes Osman claimed to have experienced. Yes. She claimed, in fact, if you read her account, which I've done, she claimed that she could tell when she was shifting from one dialect to another. Mm -hmm. So it's clear, therefore, and this is a really important point in relation to assessing the modern Pentecostal movement, it's clear that what Act 2 describes and what Agnes Osman claimed to experience is not the same as what happens in the vast majority of contexts in modern Pentecostal and charismatic churches where, and I know this firsthand because when I was a student at college, I was in a church where it was a charismatic influenced Anglican church. I was there for a few years before moving to a more conservative context where what actually happens is that people are speaking in a language where they they're claiming that it's some kind of heavenly language. It's no kind of earthly language at all. And nobody can understand it. Um, it's much more like what Paul seems to be talking about in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. And so one of the puzzles, and, and when we were talking earlier, uh, you raised the kind of burden of, burden of proof question here. Mm -hmm. One of the puzzles that we've got, and one of the questions we might perhaps like to ask to um, Pentecostal friends would be, look, what exactly are you claiming is your gift of tongues about? Is it the Act 2 thing or is it the 1 Corinthians 14 thing? Because they're different and they seem to have different functions. So in Act 2, you, even if, sorry, just yeah, to go cut you off. Even if, they, even if they don't have different functions, though, we're going right. to have to get into the issue of interpretation. Sure. Because even if, I mean, even if not different functions, even if they aren't, aren't the same languages, right? Right, right, if, right. Even if you're granted that one is a heavenly language and the other is, no, these are the languages of the people who were assembled here in mm -hmm. Jerusalem that were hearing it and were, yes. it was intelligible to them. Right. Uh, there's an issue of in, uh, intelligibility, yes, even for yes. 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. Right, right? yes, yes. So, yes. The, the, and that's really emphasized by Paul. That yeah. there needs to be intelligence or otherwise. So I think even if we don't uh, come to settle on whether they're spoken languages or heavenly languages mm -hmm. or whatever they might be, at the end of the day, we might end up in the same place. Right. Okay. Okay. Saying, you know what I mean? Like, so so let's let let me make a couple of suggestions then. Um, just to focus on Acts 2 first. Yep. And let's try and drill down. Okay, what, what function did this serve? What is it that makes it unique? Because both, both you and I are agreed that this does have a, a kind of uniqueness to it mm -hmm. in relation to its function to authenticate mm -hmm. revelation. And you had a very interesting distinction between um, signs and wonders on the one hand and miracles on the other. So let me see if I can summarize that and then you pick up and tell me what you think. Yeah, yeah. Um, Acts chapter 2 describes something that is unique, even within the book of Acts. Later in Acts 10 and Acts 19, where the, the tongues seem to be repeated, the wind and the fire are not. And so what's going on here is a little bit like the illustration I used at church when I, yesterday as we're recording this. It's the sign at the entrance to the national park. It's telling you you've entered a new era. Yes. And it's telling you that in a way that doesn't need to be and would be misleading if it were repeated at different junctures because it's telling you there's something special going on at this time, which mm -hmm. is the beginning of an era that then endures. So you don't get signs saying Yosemite National Park every 10 feet along the road. You get one at the entrance and then you know you're in this new domain. And in the same way, what happens here and this is linked with the ministry of the apostles, is you've got the sign and the ministry of the apostles working hand in hand. Right. So the sign comes, it's a unique thing. Even within the book of Acts, it's unique. And it's the thing that Joel spoke about, which is how Peter goes on to explain it. They, these guys aren't drunk. Mm -hmm. This is what the prophet Joel spoke about. This will happen in the last days. 
and he, he goes on to talk about that. By the time you hear this podcast, you'll have had a sermon on that as well, so I won't <laughs> dig into all that yet. But the point is that, that the sign authenticates what the apostles say is happening. It's his, the ascended Christ has given his spirit, which is now the possession of the church that possesses Christ by his spirit. And the apostles verify the sign. They say, this is what the prophet Joel spoke about. This mm -hmm. is not just some random babbling. And so there is this kind of mutual um, verification going on. So that the sign in the connection with the apostolic preaching tells you something about what God is doing here. It's authenticating, it's verifying something. Right. It's a sign and a wonder in your mm -hmm. language. And you wanted to distinguish that, Jeff, from something which may happen that m might be miraculous, but wouldn't have that authenticating function right. or verifying function. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, like us? healing, right? Right, so, healing. We, I mean, um, you can be a cessationist, Yes. Let's say. And just in just, terms just of, I'm sorry. That for us. Uh, yeah. Just so that, uh, Most people know. that God has uh, has stopped speaking in, you know, he's stopped revealing his his whole, he's stopped giving his people his, his revelatory special revelation. Signs. Revelatory yeah. signs have yes. ceased. Yeah, right. Okay. And so um, you can be a typically signs and wonders come yeah. with a message right. to authenticate the messenger. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's what's going on here. I think the apostles are a very special group of people and they have an, they have an empowerment from the Holy Spirit. Which is why you need to appoint a 12th one to make up the numbers. That's right. They're, right. Yeah. And they are a new Israel, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, the carriers of, of, um, of, of God's revelation. Yeah. So, um, and that's different from believing in a, a miracle in the sense right. that God can right. heal without, you know, that. In a, in a non-scientific kind of, yeah, yeah. you know, non-normal. That's right, right. We pray. We can pray for healings for, right. you know, special um, God breaking through in extraordinary yes, patterns, yes. right? Yes. To, to do we, something we, miraculous. We pray, we pray for numerous miracles in relation to the visa process by which my family. <laughs> well, but but it, it, even in relation to that, let's just cast that out a little bit more. So, the the substantive conceptual difference between what you're calling signs and wonders mm -hmm. in the act two sense and miracles more broadly. Mm -hmm. uh, the semantic difference doesn't matter so much though. I, I like it, but the, the conceptual difference is that signs and wonders necessarily authenticate the person bringing them about right. or what God is doing at that time. Whereas what we might call a miracle, God acting in some <clears throat> wonderful, miraculous way at some other time would not demonstrate anything positive if it were present right because even satan disguise, disguises himself as an angel of light and wouldn't demonstrate anything negative by its absence mm -hmm. right right so, if we don't get the right. miraculous work of god we don't that doesn't the Lord discount is still there. the right right and that's if you think about the book of esther one of the functions of the book of esther is to you know god is not even mentioned in the book of esther but you see his providence with the benefit of hindsight and history right so god is still at work even where there are no miraculous events, though we pray for them. Right. Um, and so just to get this in our minds, and it's if we had um, some of my friends back in the UK, Pentecostal friends, and I actually think um, probably most, if not almost all of them would agree with this, the absence of speaking in tongues does not mean that somebody is lacking something in terms of their relationship with God. Now, that's my Pentecostal friends. I think we probably have to address the elephant in the room at some point and recognize that there are, among Christians influenced by the Pentecostal movement, among people influenced by the Pentecostal movement, some who are less theologically wise and some, frankly, who seem like the kind of Benny Hinn end of the spectrum, who are just manipulators. Right. And I'm afraid that where you have people who say that this particular gift is the thing without which you're not a full Christian or a proper Christian or a genuine Christian, or you've not experienced all the fullness of the spirit. I just want to say, guys, that's just wrong. Mm -hmm. And, and where it comes with menaces or with send us $10 and we'll pray for you. It's, it's evil. It's worse than yeah. just yeah, wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I got to say, I mean, we talked about this earlier. 
I, I, I didn't want to raise this yesterday in the sermon because mm-hmm. it wasn't really the point of the sermon. But those 644 million people influenced by the Pentecostal movement, some mm-hmm. tragically have been influenced by leaders in the Pentecostal movement who are false teachers, right. out to manipulate, out to deceive. And they're using claims of these miraculous um, occurrences to um, put hope in the heart of often poor in sub-Saharan Africa and credulous people. Mm -hmm. And when my friend Kip Chelishaw comes here, we must ask him about this because Mm -hmm. he will tell us about some of the tragedies that he sees in Nairobi where some of the poorest people around cling to the hope that is falsely sowed to them by health, wealth, and prosperity, miracle merchant preachers, that if you just make a pledge of whatever money you have this week, you know, $58 <laughs> to live on for yeah. the, the next two weeks, if you just pledge that to the Lord, he'll return you a thousandfold. And they keep doing this and people keep giving. And it is it is really manipulative, manip- manipulative really deceitful, and so on. Right. And so I'm not, the point is not to tar all Pentecostals and Charismatics with that brush, but wiser serpents as well as innocent as doves. And it, we're not telling the truth if we don't recognize that that's out there. Right. Um, so that's I mean, yeah. the distinction you highlighted. Acts chapter 2, let's call that like a sign and wonder. It has this salvation historically uh, significant vindicatory function to attest to what god is doing yeah it almost says it almost raises its hand and says right listen to him in fact yes you know interestingly enough right we see you know it, it, as we read the old testament and we see god's um it, we see miracles in the old testament the greatest concentration of those miracles is around of course moses yes and then elijah elisha yeah yeah and then jesus right yes. and what do we see on the mountain of transfiguration right. we see jesus with those two prophets and then what's the voice from heaven say it's my beloved son with whom i will please listen to him right, right in other words right. so the signs and wonders point to heed the message right and and just to flesh that out a little bit more that is quite a well-established thesis in reformed circles i forget who who first articulated it in detail but the claim that just the obvious historical fact that if you just look through the Bible, mm-hmm. most of the signs and wonders are concentrated in those two um, portions of biblical history. Right. Moses and the Exodus and the conquest. Right. So Moses and Joshua and then Elijah, Elisha. Right. And that, I mean, that's just true. I mean, it's mm-hmm. like, that isn't, that's not, we're not asking anybody's opinion. You just count the number of crazy, miraculous, wonderful things mm-hmm. that happened. Um, there are, of course, exceptions, but there are exceptions to every generalization right. and does not I'm, I'm searching it here I'm, unless I'm it, it, it doesn't Peter in his sermon here somewhere I can't find it right now but doesn't Peter speak about Jesus being a man who was attested to yes, you by yeah, signs yeah, and yeah, wonders yeah, right? Yeah, right well I mean I'm skipping ahead and stealing thunder from future sermons yeah, but it is it's, yeah. it's, um, it's, it's verse 22 so 22. Acts 2 22 oh, yeah, so, there he, it is. so this is just, just to keep in the flow of the text um, the miraculous events happened the signs and wonders of tongues and and fire and uh, the wind. Mm -hmm. And Peter says, no, no, this isn't drunkenness. This is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. He quotes from Joel chapter two. And then he says, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, Mm -hmm. this Jesus. And then he goes on. And so what he's doing is he's deploying language, which I think you're rightly suggesting places Jesus in the company of Elijah, Elisha, Moses, Joshua, mm-hmm. as the mighty signs and wonders. In fact, John calls them signs right. in his gospel, as this is a new epoch dawning. Um, just as Moses brought the new epoch, um, Elijah and Elisha introduced the, the historic prophet era. Right. So, um, And by the way, just to... Um even rewind back up a little sure. more and bring this all together from the book of Hebrews, right? Yes. That's where we can uh, form our view of revelation, which is foundational to our mm-hmm. understanding of, of prophecy and tongues. And that is that in the past, God spoke to our forefathers many times in various ways, but in these last days, he spoken has by spoken son. Yes. by his son, which gives us a sense of progressive revelation, but then plenary 
Revelation, Climatic, right? right? Final. It's, it's yes. full. Yes. It's in, in Jesus. And yes. so what more could we yes. expect than right. and, and Jesus has spoken? And of course, we don't really have Jesus's books. We have the testimony of the apostles. Right. Which who Jesus with. himself prepared. That's right. 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 Now, and, and this again raises a point which is profoundly important for understanding what possible function any miraculous event could have today. Mm-hmm. So in, in the first century, mm-hmm. when Peter stood up, the miracles that Christ had done, which Christ continued to do, like these miraculous signs in Acts 2, right. they attested to Peter's and the other apostles' um, identity mm-hmm. and authority as mm-hmm. ambassadors of Christ. Right. Now, where do you and I get our authority to speak as ambassadors of Christ? It is not by God doing spoke miraculous to me. signs. It is by <laughs> we have a derivative authority. Right. We stand up with the words of the apostles mm-hmm. to say, look, here is what our fathers in the faith said. Thus we declare to you. And Jesus speaks in and through the preachers. Mm-hmm. Um as they expound the word which his spirit has caused to be written. So what you notice there is that there's just no space epistemologically for a contemporary pastor to appeal to a miraculous sign or wonder as something that authenticates his message. And that's the first category of person I'm really suspicious of. Yeah. Somebody who says, you should listen to me mm. because and then insert some miraculous thing he claims to be able to do, speak in tongues or heal people or multiply the income of your business a thousandfold, whatever it is. It just strikes me, before that's a pastoral disaster, which it is, I mean, it's a pastoral catastrophe, Right. it is also just a failure to understand the progression of biblical revelation and where we stand in relation to the apostles. We stand on the shoulders of the apostles, so to speak. Yep. We do not stand beside them, which is why... And I mentioned this last couple right. of weeks ago. Um, Judas had to be replaced to make up the full number of the twelve. Mm-hmm. But you don't have this same. Let's draw lots. Let's determine the will of the Spirit. After that period of the apostolic proclamation has ended, right. because of their representative function as messengers of Christ. And we just don't have to get in a room and burn paper and see white smoke to, and, yes. to appoint a new apostolic successor so right. that he can sit ex cathedra and make claims for the church either. Right. right. And I'm not being sarcastic. I'm saying no, like, this is right. what's really exactly different right. so, I mean, from us is the, we're not that we don't believe in apostolic suce- succession. It's right. once for all time kind yes. of appointment of 12 and we rely upon their testimony because their right. testimony right. is the testimony of the living Jesus. Right. So, just for the sake. By the way, can I say you, one more thing? Yeah, go on, so, so, um, I was going to say okay. that, that the smoke thing—that's how the Roman Catholics yeah, Pope, sorry, right? You was, know that. Okay, go, yeah, on, go yeah. ahead. Um, so, uh, one more. You, you were saying earlier that you know when when people say, "Well, I, you know, God spoke to me." I don't know if that's the way you said it, but if Something if somebody like, says, yeah. "If God spoke to me," we're right. going to be really leery of that. The, the really interesting thing is that. There are men out there, obviously, who are charlatans and who are you're saying, like, God spoke to me, send me money, all this kind of stuff. That's really wicked. Hmm. The softer side of that, and it really is a softer side, so I want to have empathy for it. But we hear Christians all the time say, well, God gave me a word, God spoke to me. And mm-hmm. that's where I think we need to gently challenge people Just, yeah, yeah, because yeah. I think they have a misunderstanding of what revelation is. God does not, I would challenge anybody on this, God does not speak to us individually to tell us something. That's authoritative. For, and, for authoritative right. for, you know, yes. it, no, if, if God speaks to you, you need to tell the whole world. That's how just, God speaks. He right. speaks in words that are like meant to be shared. He speaks when he's revealing something to right, 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 right. mankind. So, and, so in one sense, the, the fact that um, some of our friends... And, and, so, Revelation personal. Re- re- char- charismatics will use this language in, in lots of ways. And this is very, very common. Like in the church I mentioned, I used to go to 25 years ago, nearly 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I have a word from the Lord for you. People came yeah. and said that to yeah. me. I've got a word from the Lord for you. And most of the time it's banal, uh, but, but well-meaning and encouraging. You know, I have plans for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. 
plans to give you hope. And if you're like, well, that's great. I'm glad because <laughs> that's what the Bible says. Um, but then occasionally it's really potentially destructive. You should go be a missionary to Cuba. Yeah. Okay. Well, the problem with that is that that, that places a moral claim mm -hmm. on the person being spoken to, which the person speaking has no right to, to make. And, uh, it's, it's what's fascinating to me. Is this makes me want to think Think we should move to 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, is that mm -hmm. even in the first century, when Paul is talking about lowercase p prophets in mm -hmm. the churches, mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 14, he says, two or three prophets should speak and let the others weigh carefully what is said. Mm -hmm. Well, what that means is that the prophecy of which Paul was speaking was not authoritative. He's using prophecy in a more... I think in something a bit more like how the Puritans use the term prophesying mm -hmm. to mean um, given by God in the sense of everything is given by God, but not authoritative speech about the Lord and his ways. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's in the context of 1 Corinthians 14, it's somewhat more spontaneous, two or three might speak. It seems to me most like the kind of situation you get in a Bible study or a kind of discussion group where, you know, somebody's prepared a Bible passage to, to share some thoughts from, and then two or three people speak and the others kind of weigh what's going on. Mm. That I think is more like what Paul's talking about. And the prophecy is not um, a an authentication, and it's certainly not self-authenticating because it could be wrong. So so there you've got, I mean, this is slightly off as a, on a tangent, what, what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 14. Of course, there he's talking about the gift of tongues as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe we could speak to that issue. In 1 Corinthians 14, just to remind you, and it's, it's worth turning to it just to give you chapter and verse so that you know what. So uh, it's interesting, and, uh, you know, podcast is hardly time to try and have a <laughs> discussion where you're, well, anyway, uh, let's try and keep it easy. Even before we get to there, okay. we're going to be in, we find a prophet <laughs> in Acts, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Agabus. Agabus, he gets it wrong. Well, does he? <laughs> well, the, uh, okay. Acts 11, first of all, says there's going to be a famine. And then Acts, what is it, 21, where he says, the, With this belt, with this belt, he's going to be, the Jews are going to bind. And it Paul. was the Romans. Well, yes. But it, yeah, is that is that kind of pedantic kind of. Uh, well, is it pedantic did, or is did, it? Did detail necessary? Was, he, was Agabus wrong or was he generally speaking right? That this was going to happen was he? I mean, I think he 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 functioned as a true prophet. And what was his the nature of his prophecy? It was predictive. Yes. It was for, foretelling. Right. It was foretelling. Foretelling. It was. But in, but right? in one sense, there's two two things going on there, isn't, aren't there? That first, there is something which is retrospectively verifiable. So he's not making some banal claim. Um, there's Are we talking eleven? We're talking eleven or um, 21? The, uh, 21? the twenty-one. Okay. Yeah. It, it's not like oh, there's somebody in the room here with back pain I mean, there's 2000 people in the room right um right like duh okay yeah duh, right um is retrospectively verifiable and so he's got mm -hmm. skin in the game yes it's also it's certainly not accurate in all its points of detail jews romans now what are you supposed to do with that i don't know Mm -hmm. But what you're noticing, at the very least, you're noticing a broadening of what prophecy means, which I think makes sense in the light of 1 Corinthians, where it's clearly what the prophets in 1 Corinthians are doing is not the same as what Isaiah the prophet is doing. Isaiah the prophet doesn't stand up and give an opinion which he invites you to disagree with, if you like. You know, so there's, there's that difference, right? Right. But well, they both come from the Lord. Though, yes, right, they're both rooted in what the Lord bestows and precisely and pours so this, out upon his people. And this is what I'd want to say to um, conscientious, thoughtful, charismatic friends, right? Yeah. Um, many of them have been taught, I think, carelessly to say things like, I feel the Lord is saying, yes, or I've got a word from the Lord, or, and I'd want to say, can you find a way of articulating that? that doesn't give the misleading impression that you're claiming authority for it. Because mm -hmm. if what you mean is, when you say, I, I feel the Lord is saying, if what you mean is, look, I've been praying for you, and I just had this, this thought, which, you know, take it or leave it. Um, but it seemed like it might work. 
uh, have you thought about full-time Christian mission work in Cuba? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's very different from, I've got a word from the Lord for you. You've got to go to Cuba as a missionary. Right. And I know people who have told things like that, and it would have been far more helpful for them to have been encouraged to think and use biblical wisdom, which is actually the path to making wise decisions, than to just kind of hang their hat on whatever some, frankly, slightly emotional person said to them after a church service one Sunday evening. Yeah. So it's the, it's the claim to authority, which I think is problematic. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, for what it's worth, I'm actually I'm interested to know your thoughts about this. I think we should seek to reclaim from purely charismatic contexts the vocabulary of God is at work in my life and mm-hmm. what Jesus has been teaching me. Yes. But we should do so in a way that doesn't tacitly claim the authority to speak in Jesus' name about matters where we have no right to do so. So, for example, I think the Lord was teaching me something really valuable this morning in Psalm 110 and 111. Absolutely. Reading the Psalms. Right. And I, I want to have that. I think it would be good for us as a, as a Christian constituency mm-hmm. to reclaim the sense of immediacy of God being at work in us as we're prayerfully studying the scriptures, as we're talking to right. each other, as we're worshiping together, as we're in fellowship. That's all good. Right. I don't think what we want to do is to say things that give the impression that we get to speak, thus says the Lord. Mm-hmm. And actually, we want to reclaim that language from people who misleadingly do use it in that way. Yeah. And, you know, I use a little story here. I w- years ago, I was a youth pastor. and I took a, a group of our students to a camp that was, mm-hmm. I would say, kind of soft, charismatic. And they, mm-hmm. uh, we were f- reformed church, but it was a great deal, whatever. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, we had a, uh, <laughs> they, they, they had the counselors the first morning say, hey, we, you know, tomorrow morning we went, or the first day we got there, tomorrow morning, we want all you guys to go out. Don't even take your Bibles with you. We just want each of you to go find a quiet spot and pray and listen to the Lord speaking to you and then come back and share with us, you know, what the Lord has said. And I went back to the cabins that night and I said, you take your Bible. So here's how we're (laughs) going to redeem this. You take your Bibles with you and you read, you know, and I gave him some directives in that regard. And then you pray and then you come back and you share what the scripture said. Yeah, you know, what the scripture yeah. said and what yes. you've been meditating upon and what yes. God has spoken to you right, through right. his word. Yes. But prayer is something where you speak to God and God with the way God will speak to you yes. is and bring to That's and, right. So you know, and this touched on other issues, you know, Jeff, because um one of my passions and probably um you guess this, I think probably folks at all saints have guessed this, is to bring to people in the preaching of the word the kind of immediacy of God being at work in us and God speaking Mm -hmm. to us. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes sermons historically in reformed contexts have become Mm. just purely cognitive, intellectual. And I wonder how much of the charismatic silliness like that, because that's really what that is. Close Mm. your Bible and ask God to speak to you. It's just silly when you've got a Bible. Mm -hmm. Um, How much of that is actually driven by the fact that people have been starved of Mm real powerful preaching i make no particular claims for my preaching i try to preach in a way that is relevant and i pray that the spirit would speak and i know you do the same yeah. um but if people have been starved of that they could easily reach the conclusion that it that preaching can't really do that mm-hmm. and so we need to find the immediacy of god being at work in me by his word somewhere else and that mm-hmm. makes me sad i want to give people the kind of exciting engagement with it with the word of god that stirs their minds and sets their hearts on fire Mm -hmm. and changes their lives and the lord alone will actually bring that about and history alone will tell whether and to what degree it happens but that's Mm -hmm. my aspiration right yeah so absolutely it's yeah yeah okay so where where are we um just we haven't gotten to first corinthians we haven't got there (laughs) and and so let's just you you, are you okay if we just jump in there now Sure, sure so let's just remind you um, our listeners are all still with us. Um, well done making it this far. Um, <laughs> what's going on in First Corinthians is very, very different from Acts chapter 2. And the way you know that is because Paul says so. Um, for example, um, he says uh, at the beginning of uh, the, um, the chapter and verse 6. Um, chapter 14. Uh, chapter 14, verse 6. If I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? So tongues is there contrasted with something that reveals or teaches. Mm 
or brings insight and instruction. Um, again, um, verse 17, oh, sorry, verse, verse um, 18. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. Nevertheless, in church, I'd rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. What that means is the, the tongues of which he's speaking are not intelligible, which is why throughout this, he um, insists on uh, interpretation or the private use of this gift. And so we've got a, question, got a couple of questions here. We've got, okay, what does the interpretation involve? Why might the private use of the gift be valuable? And then we've also got the question, are there grounds for thinking that this gift also is a more restricted first century apostolic era <laughs> gift or not? Yeah. And that's inevitably going to tangle us up in another elephant in the room, which is, okay, how many of our charismatic friends, when they think they're speaking in tongues of angels, are actually just speaking gibberish that they've learned to create? And I got to tell you, honestly, when I was 30 um, odd years ago, this church in Oxford, it's called St. Old Eights Church, still there, I believe, big church. Um, we were in encouraged to just start saying something and one or two of the more cynical or maybe one or two of the more wise people said you know that we had this joke he'll have a lager she'll have a shandy what's that he'll have a lager she'll oh. have a shandy just say that really fast <laughs> yeah that's hard he'll, he'll have, have a lager. lager he'll have a lager she'll have a shandy she'll, oh yeah okay. it, it, that actually sounds quite a lot like what some of the people would say ah uh, yeah, right. i get you okay Lager is like a kind of English beer. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. And, yeah. and okay, so it, it, it's this sounds like it's mockery. Well, it's if it is, it is well intentioned, gentle. None of us are taking the gloves off. Um, <laughs> it's designed just to prompt the thought. Like, is it possible that actually what's happened is that lots of Christian people and maybe even some Christian leaders have found themselves in circles where they have been encouraged wrongly to believe that there is this deeper experience of God that's available to them, mm. which is accessed through this unlearned language. And that if they are able to work themselves into an emotional state and just find a way of producing that sound, that the less guarded of them will do so, mm. which will encourage the more guarded of them to do so. And there'll be some kind of experience of being together there that is, I guess they subjectively find it positive but actually objectively it's just gibberish right nobody is being instructed and not even the lord is being prayed to in those meaningless sounds right and, and i i'm not ready to say that's the case with everybody who speaks in tongues certainly not but i'm afraid i am ready to ask the question is it not possible that this happens quite a lot because people are suggestible people are sometimes naive yeah. uh, tragically some people are manipulative mm. um, and would like to uh, build a ministry for themselves that that people hanker after because it promises this kind of deeper spiritual life so now that that's not touching on the theological question like what, what is going on in first Corinthians 14? Well, and also and doesn't, more... Yeah. And it also doesn't touch upon the question of whether this is still normative. Right. So let's try and pick up those. Yeah. Let, let, do you have any thoughts about either of them? I've got one or two things I want to say about the, the theological purpose of tongues, but do you want to talk? Yeah. About well, that? I mean, obviously the emphasis in first Corinthians 14 over and over and over with regard to tongues is um, that they need to be interpreted. Right. Or else. Right. You know, sit down. Yes. Um, yes. So there's that aspect, but even that doesn't answer whether they're normative for our day. Right. My answer would be no. Right. Um, and that that also is tied to the age of the apostles, who right. were the ones right. who, um, yes, I mean, we, really, you know, introduced tongues, and I would even say, in a sense, um, regulated, bestowed the gift of tongues. Uh, and, and well, I mean, it's Jesus who does so, but through sure, his sure, apostles. Sure, sure. And and when that age ends, I think 
you yeah. know, I mean, we don't always appreciate the advantage that we have over, let's say, the Corinthians. Right. right. Who did not have any New Testament corpus to turn to. Mm. Who did not have the, you know, the gospel narratives yes. as we do, right? Yeah. Um, who did not have preachers who had, you know, who had studied all these things, who had yes. men like uh, Apollos who had to be pulled aside by yeah, before <laughs> more, did any more novice <laughs> folks who had to teach him yeah, yeah, yeah. more clearly the way. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah I mean, and so, different age. So in, in a slightly different way from Acts 2, because it's a different sign, mm -hmm. you're wanting to say, um, is there not some sense in which the, firstly, if this First Corinthians gift is to be used at all, it is to be used either privately, come to that in a second, or in some kind of revelatory capacity. Right. And that revelatory function is necessarily tied to the apostolic era in which it was situated because of their unique role in being the guardians of revelation. Right. And I guess that the only, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the one hesitancy I'd have with that is to say, well, in Corinth, it was practiced, and Paul seems to think. It's okay mm -hmm. if it is interpreted mm -hmm. and that the interpretations are themselves not infallible anyway. But still, you've got it in this inaugural era of gospel expansion, which I think is very likely sufficient to tie it to that first century period. So just we use the term cessationist before. Mm -hmm. right. In formal terms, I would say I am definitely a cessationist in relation to gifts that have a revelatory or signing function, revelatory, mm -hmm. revealing truth from God, signing or signifying, uh, identifying or vindicating or validating the ministry of people or of, of particular events. Um, I'm certainly not a cessationist in relation to God, can God do miracles generally. Right. Now, I don't think anybody is, thinks all miracles have ceased. We all mm -hmm. pray for people to be healed. Mm -hmm. Um but we want to distinguish those miracles from the revelatory miracles of the New Testament era. Now, could something that involves speaking be given today as a miraculous gift, just as something involving healing be done today as a miraculous gift? Um, honestly, I, I, I don't feel in a position to rule it out but I don't feel a very strong compulsion to rule it in theologically. Yeah. I tell you what, where I'm left, honestly, and again, this is a story that may illuminate this. There was a young lady at the church that I used to work in back in um, 2000. Mm -hmm. First church I ever worked at. It was a conservative evangelical church. It was not a charismatic church. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, uh, the pastor used to discourage people from embracing these particular gifts for the kind of reasons that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But there was one young lady there, and as it happened, I led a, a Bible study for students with her. There were, there were men, men and women would lead Bible studies together and, because there were men and women in the group, and there was sort of personal work to be done both. So this young lady who I used to, and Nicole was in the group as well. So anyway, th but this young lady came to me once, and she said, Steve, I wanted your advice about something. I think I have the gift of tongues. I was like, okay, well, Tell me about it. And, and she said, well, I, when I'm praying on my own, I feel like I'm able to speak in a language. I don't know what it means. Um, and I pray to God and that, yeah, she was wanting advice. Now, what was interesting was that she wasn't sure what she was saying. Mm -hmm. She's pretty sure she didn't know what she was saying. She didn't even know with any great certainty that she had this gift. She didn't know whether she'd been influenced by other people who had, um, instilled in her this a false sense of this. But at the same time, she was not a credulous person. Now, anybody can be misled. Sure. But she, she, was, she was not in a church context that would have encouraged right. a fanciful embrace of this. She was just a, she was a Christian young woman. right? And so my advice to her was, look, okay, well, you're right not to use this gift publicly because it's not edifying for anybody else. Mm -hmm. And I just encourage you to make sure you're also praying in English because don't, don't let this subsume your prayer life entirely. Mm -hmm. And I think I would still give that advice today. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I would. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would do so because I don't know what that is. 
I'm very sure it's not Acts chapter 2. Mm-hmm. I'm very sure it doesn't have any meaningful revelatory function in terms of an authoritative revelation. But could God for a time, um, even in a, a situation where somebody is misunderstanding what's going on, enable somebody to speak in a, a strange and inexplicable way? I, I, I don't feel able to rule that out. But I'm far... I, I think it's far more likely that there are lots of people who are mistakenly thinking they do have that gift than that there's millions of Christians missing out that they don't. Right. I think that's not true. To miss out on this is not to miss out at all. Paul says so. Right. I'd, I'd rather have you prophesy and in the sense that he means that. Um, yeah. And, of course, the whole flow of 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, it's... Um, it sandwiches chapter 13 love. The, the greatest of these is love yeah. and and that's um uh, that's the context from which the prophecy tongues dichotomy emerges it's like mm-hmm. which of these two will best be an expression in your context of love for somebody else mm-hmm. so i'd rather i'd rather people were able to pray with each other yeah <laughs> for each other in meaningful ways and that seems to be pause five intelligible emphasis. words right. right five exactly right. five intelligible words right and the so, so that's I, that's where I'd end up with the um, First Corinthians gift today. Would you want to add anything to that? I, you know, I I could sit here and, as a cessationist, who might even be, we're both cessationists, yeah, so it's yeah. not a matter of you not being and me sure. being, you know. But um, a hard, you know, hardline cessationist probably, mm-hmm. I, I would fit that bill uh, pretty well. Um, part of me wants to soften that by saying, you know, if, if somebody who was, we hear these stories of, um, Muslims and Islam, closed Islamic countries receiving a, a dream, a vision of Jesus who spoke to them. They became a believer. Yeah, they yeah, yeah. converted to Christianity. They counted the cost in doing so. Hmm. And, um, boy, I don't want to say, well, you should be a cessationist. Don't you know that Jesus doesn't reveal himself that way to people anymore? Hmm. I don't want to be that guy, and I, I don't want to make that statement. At the same time, I want to hold to the to the line that um, there's something really special about the apostolic era hmm. and that the gift of tongues needs to be associated with it. And with the closing hmm. of that era, I believe yes. that we have closed the, the need for any relevatory gifts yes of which prophecy and tongues both belong in that category well, and the thing is you don't have to be that guy <laughs> and here's a couple of reasons why the first is that a a, a muslim mm-hmm. who converts to christ in those circumstances is going to evince their conversion by a hunger for the word of god mm-hmm. and for the scriptures and for preaching right and for fellowship mm-hmm. um and and of a, a um, a person who was in that situation who was growing in maturity, you'd expect them not to attach revelatory significance to that dream mm-hmm. in the sense of, well, Jesus spoke those words in that dream and those words ought to be stapled into the back of my Bible. Um, and you'd be, what, you'd be concerned about them if they did think that. Right. The other thing that, that's just worth pointing out is that uh, somebody f- in whom God does something miraculous of that kind, remember it's not an authenticating or self-authenticating revelatory event. It is God doing something that Mm. has a certain consequence, leads into faith in Christ. Mm. Um, Somebody who experiences that is very different from somebody in the modern Western world who's in a kind of consumerist, charismatic church trip and wants to just find a place that scratches where they emotionally itch. So a Muslim who converts to Christ very likely loses their family, may, may lose their job, um, may even face worse consequences than that. I'm much more ready to believe that the Lord is doing something unusual and miraculous there mm-hmm. than that he's anywhere to be found at a Benny Hinn rally, right? Because yeah. it just seems to me that it's much more in keeping with biblical wisdom to expect God to reach out in his grace and miraculously work for those who are oppressed than for we well, don't need to go into the details, but right. if you've never heard of Benny Hinn, just Google it once and then you're, you're done probably. Um, yeah. 
So, the ultimate prosperity gospel. Yeah, yeah, really. And it's the almost the it's almost a a parody of everything that is that discredits the modern evangelical church. Mm-hmm. It's a an emotional um, and self indulgent and shallow mm-hmm. and manipulated and manipulative attempt to get happy nice things now. And Lord preserve us if we ever have any version of that. Yeah. So where does that leave us? I mean, I think we've got, we've covered a bunch of stuff, haven't we? And there's the biblical and theological material, the, the place of these biblical signs and wonders as distinct from miracles that God can perform. We've got um, some pastoral thoughts there and some, I, I want to register some pastoral concern for those 644 million people. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, while at the same time saying, you know, there are, there are kind of conservative Pentecostals, biblically conservative Pentecostals who will thump the Bible with us. And they just happen to believe also that there's this particular gift, which continues, which some of their church members sometimes are encouraged to use. Right. You know, there, there's a big spectrum there. Mm-hmm. And, that is that spectrum that I didn't speak about yeah. in yesterday. I mean, isn't a, uh, Assemblies of God the largest Pentecostal denomination in so. the U.S.? Yeah, and I have many AOG friends. Yeah, yeah, who you know I think are wonderful Christians, and I don't worry right. for them so right. much. I mean, I would rather them make their way out of the AOG and into yes. whatever yes. you know, <laughs> a conservative yes. Presbyterian church. But, but, but I mean, that that then raises a bunch of just cultural issues, doesn't it? I mean, so how you say uh, you'd rather they made their way out of that and truth is that the things that shape our Hmm. church affiliations are to some degree cultural sure and in america that has a particular shape to it Mm -hmm. um like just like it does in europe and in in the uk um we love decently and in order don't we yeah right yeah know thyself right we we should know ourselves just as we're asking others to know their own so decently and in order does not mean uh, mournfully mm-hmm. and without enthusiasm. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, because here's, here's the danger. If, if I say what I'm about to say, and there's and it sounds like it's just such a kind of cheap um, olive branch, but I do think we have something we can learn from the best of our Pentecostal friends, right? Now, that's right. not just the kind of generic, bland, oh, we've all got something we can learn from each other. Okay. I think as a, as a congregation, for example, let's take our singing. I think mm-hmm. our singing is exuberant. I love sitting at the front of church because I've got 200 people, 250 people behind blasting me in the ears. And right. if you've never sat at the front of church, then try and get there early and sit on the third pew forward and it'll, it'll blow your ears off. I think still probably we could be more so. Mm-hmm. I've sat at the back of church sometimes. And I, you know, I think all right. of us could lift our voices in prayer. Mm-hmm. I think probably there are times when um, the... Um, the felt commitment to Christ is lacking in us. Sure. And that's not to exalt the emotions and sort of start to plunder romanticism. I think right. I think a lot of what lies behind the charismatic movement is the romantic movement, the, the primacy of the emotions and the sense that only the spontaneous and only the emotional is real. That's not true. But at the same time, David is a pretty emotional guy. Paul's yeah. a pretty emotional guy. Yeah. Um, I think it, it's to, to to seek to uh, to live the kinds of lives that are shaped by a deep seated love for Jesus. That's an interesting mm-hmm. question to ask, right? If if you talk to the most mature of our charismatic and Pentecostal friends, you said, "Do you love Jesus?" They would say yes. If you talk to our children, um, children in Reformed churches, I've asked children, "Do you love Jesus?" And they're like, "Yes." I think if you sometimes if you ask their parents, their parents feel like they're being asked a slightly embarrassing question. Because yeah. and maybe it's because for them, do you love Jesus is contaminated with some of the emotional baggage of post charismatic experience. But we have to be able to say we love Jesus, correct? Yes. Absolutely. And without reservation. Yeah. And, and yet I, I get what you're saying, because they could we ask if we were to ask adults in our church that they might feel like, well, 
Is this well, a trick not, question? No, I don't love Jesus the way I ought to love Jesus. You know, and you're like, <laughs> yes, charismatic. Do you love Jesus? Yes, I love Jesus. You know, yeah, hallelujah. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. yeah. And nobody thinks that we need to change our worship or change, try no, and no. Uh, change our exuberance or put on any airs whatsoever. Yeah. But it is really helpful to know that, um, I mean, if we were to, to, to travel to parts of Africa, right, and 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 see kind of singing with clapping and dancing and in pentecostal churches and non-pentecostal right. churches yes. we would say this is fitting yes this is fitting what we do is fitting and, in order. and then what yeah. they do is fitting and, and so there is there's the interesting factor there is that um some of these theological distinctions also overlay onto cultural distinctions mm -hmm. um and mean that a, a simple description of what's the right way to express ourselves is not easy the um i'm i'm british right so the way i when i get emotional i go from this to this you know <laughs> which, I, quite, I picked it up you though. picked it up yeah. right there's a bit that's a pretty big change for, <laughs> for an englishman um so i think we do have that and i guess at the same time you want to you want to acknowledge you know i um I love the lord your god with all your heart doesn't it's That's not all that unemotional. You are. That's it's all not... that you are. Right, exactly. Right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we have probably offended everybody, which is great. Um, <laughs> that wasn't the intention. Um, any final thoughts you want to throw into the mix um, as we're thinking? We've gone on for nearly an hour, I've realized, which is good. Any final thoughts for us? No. I think we've got plenty more chapters and acts, and we, we can have, come back to this. Have. Certainly, if yeah. uh, feel free to elicit, you know, solicit your questions, right? Yeah, yeah. Send them in. So, any questions? You just you know my email address. Um, sj at is it sj at all saints. Yeah, sj at all saints kirk. I yeah. don't use that address very much. I use my Gmail account. But those of you who are at all saints know how to get hold of me. If you're not at all saints um, and you live in all, in Fort Worth and you haven't got a church, come and visit us at least once. If you have got a church, give our greetings to your uh, friends and your pastors there, and don't come and visit us because you should be perfectly happy there. Um, mm -hmm. And um, but otherwise, yeah, ping all your questions in. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Thanks. Pastor Shaw. And those of you who've made it to the end, Lord bless you. God bless. And bye for now.